May these words be spoken and heard in the power of love. Amen. Around the country today, as I mentioned earlier, Anglicans are joining in celebrations to mark 150 years since the first contact between Christianity and the people of the Torres Strait Islands. And these celebrations of that event will enrich our observance of NADOC week this year. Rather than detracting or distracting from NADOC, these celebrations of 150 years since the coming of the light focus our attention on one specific example of the encounters between the indigenous peoples of this ancient land and those who came from other places. Today, as it were, we zoom up close to hear and reflect upon one of many stories from the past 200 plus years. That story is unique, but it is also part of the rich tapestry of what is now a shared journey as one nation, and it offers us some clues for the future. People have been living on the islands of the strait between the lands we now call Australia and Papua since before the time of Abraham. I mention that simply so that we align the timeline for the Torres Strait with the timeline, the spiritual timeline of our own sacred stories. And of course we recognise that two and a half thousand years or whatever of continuous presence is only one small part of a, of a story that lasts more than 60,000 years of continuous indigenous presence in this land. So even though 2,500 is not a big part of 60,000, I think it's important to acknowledge the deep history of the islanders at the top end. The events we commemorate today and which are reenacted every year in the islands occurred late afternoon on Saturday the 1st of July, 1871. Interestingly, around the same time as the people at Upper Copmanhurst were building the first Church of the Holy Apostles. We might just want to align those stories as well. I'm going to read a description provided by ABM, the Anglican Board of Mission. In 1871, the Reverend Samuel McFarland and the Reverend Archibald Murray of the London Missionary Society, together with eight New Caledonian mission teachers arrived off the coast of Erub, or Darnley Island, in the far eastern Torres Strait. Their ship, delightfully named the Surprise, anchored off Kemus Beach and lowered its boat for McFarland and the others to go ashore. From a small hill, a warrior called Dabab was watching he called his men to follow him and made his way down to the water's edge. McFarland waded ashore over the volcanic rock pools. He dropped to his knees on the beach before the fearsome looking islanders, the Arubians. McFarland grasped his Bible in both in his hands and thrust it towards Dubad. Then something remarkable happened. Dabad stayed his spear and accepted the book, which he could not read, but which would bring new light to all those warring islands. This was the new era for the islands of the Torres Strait, which would become known as the coming of the light. And earlier this year, Auntie Rose Elu, who is the 2021 Queensland Senior Australian of the Year, described that moment this way in the words of her family. The chief used a word which meant no more bloodshed. We will not kill these people. They are bringing something, 
something we need to learn. What is it? We will get them to tell us. One of the things that happened then was that the warfare stopped. And another islander, Father Alamo Tapim, his words are recorded in a, a paper for a conference some years ago, describes it this way. For us, the celebration of the coming of the light is just like celebrating Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, God came to us in the form of a baby. And on July 1, God came to the Torres Strait in the form of a book. Fascinating ways of speaking about God and scripture and so on. So as we reflect on, on all that, 150 years since that pivotal encounter, a few insights have come to mind. One of them is that as the current Torres Strait Islanders say, God was on both sides of the beach. God did not arrive on the surprise. God did not arrive with the white fellas. God was on both sides of the beach. He was already present with the people in the Torres Strait, and yet in another sense, God was also present in a special way in the book which told the story of Jesus. And indeed, the story of God among the Jewish people long before the time of Jesus. That may well be a mindset we need to embrace as we seek to engage with our neighbours and our families. God is already present in their lives, in their culture, in their history. They may not know much about Jesus or the Bible, but God is not missing from their lives. Our task is to connect and to expand not to eradicate and replace. And that was certainly the story of the mingling of Christianity and traditional religion in the Torres Strait. A second observation that comes to mind is that beginning on that day, and certainly now, the Christian community in the Torres Strait is an indigenous church. And that's a precious gift to the National Church of Australia. Within our family of Anglicans in this land, we have an authentic Christian church whose cultural DNA is not the culture of Victorian England. Indeed, most of those who landed on Erub Island that Saturday in 1871 were Melanesian Christians from New Caledonia, who shared, of course, so much of the broader culture and colonial experience of the people with whom they were sharing their faith. And just in the last 12 months, another group of Melanesian brothers has arrived on Thursday Island to continue and to rejuvenate the legacy of those first Melanesian missionaries. Again, I'm quoting from material on the ABM website. The brothers aim to live the gospel in a direct and simple way, following Christ's example of prayer, mission, and service. They live alongside the people they are serving, respecting their traditions and customs. The brothers follow a daily cycle of prayer and daily Eucharist, and they take vows of poverty, celibacy, and obedience with many serving between seven and 20 years. Some take life vows. They not only offer spiritual teaching, but also practical assistance. They plant, harvest, fish, build, eat, and share with everyone in their care. And all that is happening at the top end of our country, mostly beyond our gaze. So we begin to catch a glimpse that those who we once imagined ourselves missioning may themselves have a mission to us. 
we may have something to learn from them. How does the light come to us from the Torres Strait rather than the light arriving in the Torres Strait? Let me offer one example. I'm sure we'll all recognize the name Eddie Mabo. Eddie was born on Mur Island in the Torres Strait and was a traditional custodian of his ancestral lands. In his campaign for recognition of his traditional land rights under Australian law, Mabo shone the light of the gospel on the legal lie of terra nullius, on which we had constructed a nation and created our so-called commonwealth. With the coming of the light brought to us by Eddie Mabo, we have new opportunities for reconciliation and justice for all the people who call Australia home. Around the same time that the islands in the Torres Strait were being settled, the prophet Micah spoke to the people in Jerusalem. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Nothing in there about offering envelopes. Nothing in there about coming to church every Sunday, both of which I'm happy you do. But I'm just saying the three things that really matter are do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. And we can't get to the third without first engaging the other two. Jesus says much the same thing in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How well those words describe the missionaries who arrived on Erub Beach in July 1871. In the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which has been printed in today's service book, and there's a copy on display at the front door as well, we can discern three things which the wider community has been asked to do. And while these requests were really directed towards the government, which of course has, failed, has conspicuously failed to pick up on those requests, perhaps we as a church can lead where the government fails and they can catch up when they see the light. The first thing we were asked to do was to listen. This was expressed at the time in the statement as creating a voice to the parliament but perhaps we also need a voice to the church. We can choose to remember and we can cease choosing to forget. And that starts here. It's very local. And I'll refer you again to the information that's in the bulletin in the service book this week, immediately after the Uluru Statement from the Heart, where there's just a brief description of some local actions we're taking as a cathedral to listen and to remember. We might describe this as letting the light come. Once we've listened, once we've remembered, then we need to speak the truth. We need to speak plainly about the violence by which the land was taken from the indigenous people, their women raped, and their children stolen. This will be painful and hard, but we can do nothing less. With the coming of the light, the shameless acts done in the darkness of the past will be exposed. 
Other steps will be less painful, but still important, such as using the names given to this country by the First Nations, rather than imposing names on this land that come from the British Isles. Or in the case of our own town in Grafton, the name of an English Duke and a sometime Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Perhaps we'll get used to saying Jadulmani instead of Grafton. Beyond listening and truth-telling, there's then a need for reconciliation as we act together to create a better shared future. Then we shall indeed find ourselves in a brand new day as the musical from the 70s, I think it was, reminded us, and as our Reverend Yeagle Elder, Lenore Parker, expressed so beautifully at the end of her prayer, which you can find on page 218 in our prayer book. And I'm going to read that prayer as I wrap up this sermon. If Lenore was here, she could recite it without looking at a text, of course. God of holy dreaming, great creator spirit, from the dawn of creation, you have given your children the good things of Mother Earth. You spoke and the gum tree grew. In the vast desert and dense forest and in cities at the water's edge, creation sings your praise. Your presence endures as the rock at the heart of our land. When Jesus hung on the tree, you heard the cries of all your people and became one with your wounded ones, the convicts, the hunted, and the dispossessed. The sunrise of your sun coloured the earth anew and bathed it in glorious hope. In Jesus, we have been reconciled to you, to each other, and to your whole creation. Lead us on, great spirit, as we gather from the four corners of the earth. Enable us to walk together in trust, from the hurt and shame of the past into the full day which has dawned in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.